greet you in Jesus' name. Good to be with you this morning. It's an honor to be here. Of course, uh, Rod and I have been in the trenches together for many years. I've grown very close to Rod. I have great love for Rod. And I'm looking forward to getting to know Rick uh, better. I've known Rick, but uh, kind of from a distance a little bit more. So it's good to be with you. Praise the Lord for a Bible teaching church. Uh, we need more of them. Praise the Lord for every one of them. And uh, it's my privilege to share with you this morning from the Word of God. Uh, we're going to be in Romans 12 this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. I've titled the message, A Living Sacrifice. And uh, let me lead us in a quick word of prayer before we get into the Word. Lord, again, we thank you for your Word. Minister to our hearts as we study together. Give me grace to teach accurately and clearly. Uh, make the appropriate applications to our lives as your people. Well, we commit our study uh, to you this morning now. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, you'll note, uh, let's see here. You know, bear with me as I'm... Ah, it works. That's great. Uh, this is my uh, outline for uh, the book of Romans, and it is my outline. But uh, note uh, the theme is the righteousness of God, and then we could break it down this way. You have a salutation to begin the book. Uh, major theme that he first hits is sin, the issue of sin. And uh, many give the uh, theme as the gospel of God. It's a little broader than that. The righteousness of God, I think, is more accurate but then, uh, following sin, he shows that we're saved by faith alone in chapter 3b through 4. Uh, the solidarity we have with both Adam and then Christ as believers in chapter 5, followed by sanctification, chapter 6, uh, struggle with indwelling sin, chapter 7, emphasis on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned more in Romans chapter 8 than in any other chapter in the Bible. Uh, you have that great struggle with sin in Romans chapter 7. What's the answer to that? Well, it's uh, the Holy Spirit, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, and the security that goes with that. And then we have a, kind of a parenthesis in chapters 9 through 11 on the sovereign plan of God, and a great uh, theme there related to Israel and how God is not done with Israel. And then finally, we come to uh, the service chapters in chapters 12 through 15, and then the sign out, chapter 16. Uh, key verses here in Romans, Romans 1, 16 and 17, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. There's a lot about faith here in these key verses. Four times in these two verses, he names either believe or faith, which are uh, synonymous. Uh, we're saved by believing, and then the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Notice he says, in it, that is, in the gospel believed, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, this combination of revealed with, from faith to faith, I think is key to properly understanding the sense of saving faith as revealed in the book of Romans. I love this uh, definition from a vine. Let's see, did I hit the wrong one? Can I back up? There you go. I'm learning. Uh, vine says, uh, from faith points to the initial act, to faith, to the life of faith, which issues from it. That would be my understanding. I agree with Vine there. Uh, the righteous, that, that is those declared righteous on the basis of faith, <clears throat> live by faith. They have a living faith that defines their life. They live by it. Now, faith is a really big thing before God. In fact, in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, we know that apart from the mysterious working of God, no one can come to faith on their own. I mean, Paul is very clear earlier in the book that there, there is none that seeks after God. No, not one. Left to our, ourselves, we never would uh, make a move towards God. Now, while that is certainly true, it doesn't dismiss human responsibility and human response from the equation. You see, Paul in the book of Romans presents two great bookends to the letter. We might call them the bookends of the obedience of faith. He both starts 
and ends there. So note uh, chapter 1, verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Well, to what end? To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. I mean, Paul says, really, this is my calling. This is the goal. And then at the end of the book, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all nations, leading to the obedience of faith. This is the all-important issue, the obedience of faith. Now, we're not saved by the obedience of works, but we are saved by the obedience of faith, as Paul brings out in the bookends of Romans. And not only that, he brings it out all along the way as well. For example, in Romans 6, 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. I think he's talking about the obedience of faith. To that form of teaching to which you were committed, the gospel. And then Romans 11, 8, uh, 15, 18, rather. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by the word and deed. Whereas the obedience of faith is found, it invariably ushers in the obedience of works as a matter of fruit. You see, faith works. We're not saved by faith plus works, but we are saved by a faith that works. James chapter 2. Righteousness acquired on the basis of faith is a great theme in Romans, but behind it all is the mercies of God that brought us to that point. As Paul says at the end of Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever, amen. Everything has been building towards Romans 12, which is where we are in our study this morning. Paul first shows we are all sinners, Romans 1, B through 3. He then develops the theme of justification by faith in 3b and 4, with Abraham being the great example of faith. Our faith then ushers in solidarity with Christ, as seen in Romans 5. Our position uh, in Christ uh, segues to the topic of sanctification in Romans 6 through 8. And then the truth of God's covenant faithfulness is developed in Romans 9 through 11, as seen in relationship to Israel and then applied to the church. And that brings us to our text, Romans 12, 1 and 2. This text is a pivotal point in the book, and yet it is based on all that has gone before in the letter. This is how Paul commonly writes, by the way, in his, in his epistles. He commonly lays down a doctrinal foundation on, in the first part of the book and then develops practical application on top of it. Doctrine first, then duty. And he does this in Romans as well. Well, what Paul does here in Romans 12, 1 and 2 uh, is exhort the believer to now live consistent with the mercy shown to him. This is the great challenge in the Christian's life, to live consistently with our position in Christ. Leon Morris says, Paul is still concerned with justification by faith, for it is fundamental to him that the justified man not live in the same way as the unrepentant sinner. Uh, let me give you my outline of our study here this morning. Uh, the basis of commitment, the mercies of God. The character of commitment, a living sacrifice. And then the demands of the commitment, not conformed to the world, transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then the effects of the commitment prove the will of God. Well, let's get into the text, Romans 12, 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul here uses the language of appeal uh, versus a direct command. It's a language of grace. You see, the law commands, do these things and you will live. Grace says, you have life, now live accordingly. 
live, and you will do these things. The word urge literally means to call to, uh, which is the idea of an exhortation or strongly appealing to. The word therefore reaches back to what has previously been said and builds a conclusion upon it. Paul addresses the readers as brethren, affectionately addressing them as fellow Christians in the family of God. Well, on the basis of all that has gone before in the letter, Paul now appeals to them by the mercies of God. The word by means in view of or because of, on the grounds of the mercies of God. The mercies of God here are plural as they are many and varied. Paul sees the collective package of what God has done for the believer as a series of mercies. Uh, this particular word, mercy, essentially means uh, to have pity or compassion on, an, uh, on the undeserving. And that's who we are, the undeserving who have received of the mercies of God. Mercy is God's gracious withholding of judgment. That is deserved. God can withhold judgment <clears throat> that we deserve because Christ in love has taken our punishment, allowing God to extend mercy to us. Romans 9.23 says, God bestows the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy. That's who we are, vessels of mercy, whom He has prepared for glory. You see, we deserve eternal damnation, eternal judgment. But because of God's mercy, we're on our way to glory. It's an amazing thing to think about. Uh, thus, we have received mercy upon mercy upon mercy. In Romans 1 through 11, Paul has categorized mercies, the kindnesses of God, resulting in our salvation. On that basis, Paul now exhorts the believer to present his body as a living sacrifice. Uh, note some representative mercies uh, we see in the book. Justification by faith, identification in Christ, being under grace, not law, the indwelling spirit, helping our weaknesses, the election of grace, promise of coming glory, nothing can separate us from God's love, provision made for all, the absolute faithfulness of God. The point is, none of these mercies are deserved. They're mercies. We do not serve God to get saved. Rather, we serve because we've already been saved on the basis of God's mercy. We serve out of gratitude because of what He has done for us. We serve because we now love Him because He first loved us. We have been saved on the basis of God's mercies. And that is what is to be the major motivation for us to be a living sacrifice. Now, we want to serve God, and yet at the same time, we need exhortation, do we not? We need encouragement. And that is exactly what we have here in Paul's appeal to the believer on the basis of God's mercies. On the basis of God's mercies, uh, all these kindnesses that he has shown to us as undeserving sinners, on that basis, Paul says, I want you to present your bodies now. Your body's a living sacrifice. We serve God in the context of the body. Uh, Two-pronged emphasis here uh, in the context of the body of Christ. In fact, as he says, commit yourself a living sacrifice, the flow of the thought here relates to the body of Christ, which is what he goes on to talk about in terms of using our spiritual gifts, in terms of how we treat one another. I really think if you are a living sacrifice, you are serving in the context of the body of Christ. But in the immediate context here in this verse, what he's really talking about is our physical body. One says, well, I don't ever do too much, <clears throat> but I have lots of nice thoughts. Uh, you know what? Uh, it's not really your thoughts that count. I mean, yeah, it starts there. But uh, we really need to live it out. Now, just think about it. Paul here in Romans 12 exhorts us to present our physical bodies as a living sacrifice to God. You see, the body represents the totality of one's life and activities. The body is the vehicle of expression. We live out life through the body. Paul has said basically the same thing back in chapter 6, after emphasizing justification by faith alone in chapters 3b and 4, 
And then our solidarity with Christ in chapter 5. In chapter 6, he emphasizes that we should present ourselves to God to serve his righteous purposes. To present your body means to yield what you do with your body to God. It's that simple. You now want to use your body for God. When you awake in the morning, you should say, God, I'm all yours. Use my body today for your glory. As a believer, God is now living in your body. You are the temple of the living God. Jesus bought you with his blood. You no longer belong to the devil. You no longer belong to yourself. You belong to Christ. He bought you with his precious blood. You belong to him. Your body is no longer yours to do with it as you want to, as you, will, as you please. It now belongs to him. And he wants you to present your body to him as a living sacrifice. Here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You know, the world has a slogan today that says, my body, my choice. Maybe you've heard this. Uh, that is very non-Christian. I understand the world saying it, but not us Christians. As Christians, we now say of our body, Christ's body, his choice. It's not my body. It's now Christ. It belongs to him. He bought me. We're here to serve his purposes not a self-agenda. I wonder, I think a lot of uh, American Christians feel like, well, Christ bought me and I'm on my way to glory, but, but in the meantime, it's really my life to live as I want to. N no, no, not really, not really. We are called to be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice means I'm not going to live for me, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to sacrifice self on the altar. I'm going to live for God. In presenting a sacrifice, you devote something to God. And in this case, you are called upon to present yourself. Yourself. Your body as a living sacrifice. Now, the people of Paul's day knew very well the concept of a sacrifice being made either to God, the true God, or false gods. These sacrifices were always offered up dead. End of story. The sacrifice was total and complete. But you see, we are different. We are a, to be a living sacrifice. We now have life, Christ's life. As those sharing in Christ's life, we are now to offer up our bodies in complete devotion to God. Now, it is sacrificial in the sense that we are no longer to live with a self-agenda, no longer do what pleases the flesh, but rather now our whole devotion as a way of life is to serve God's purposes. That is being a living sacrifice. As a way of life, it lives by the maxim, not my will, but God's will be done. Now it's often quipped that the problem with the living sacrifice is that it so often wants to crawl off the altar. And, and that truly is our struggle. Uh, we want to serve God sacrificially, but we still have the flesh and there are many distractions, entanglements, challenges. The battle is real as noted in Romans 7. The key is found in presenting yourselves, committing yourself to be a living sacrifice, living all out for God as one who now shares in his life. You know what this involves? It involves living intentionally. It involves a specific commitment to do so. And the mercies of God are a motivation to that end. I mean, if you really appreciate all that God in his kindness has done for you, it will motivate you to want to sell out for God. C.T. Studd, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. This is really radical stuff. What I'm presenting to you this morning, sometimes we can, it's intellectual assent, but really we're talking about a heart commitment. It seems to me many Christians kind of want to go part way, but not all the way. They, they like the living, but not so much the sacrifice. 
But Christ not only calls us to life, but to be a living sacrifice as a way of life. A young man, there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, all these stories, they're great stories, they make great, you know, application, but anyway, here's the story. A young man was being interviewed by a pro, for a pros, prospective job, and he had a neat appearance. He looked pretty good, sharp, sharply dressed. Uh, he made a good first impression, and uh, the owner of the business uh, <clears throat> took his resume and looked at it, and it seemed pretty impressive. He, he listed his pastor, Sunday school teachers, elders, deacons. Well, as he studied, the, the owner of the business studied the resume for several minutes, but then he said, I appreciate these recommendations from your church friends, but I would really like to see is and hear from someone who knows you on weekdays. Ah, there you go. There you go. You know, most of your time you live outside the church context, right? How do we live during the week? Are we living out a living sacrifice consistently? The language of sacrifice is not a part-time thing. Rather, it's sellout, complete devotion that gives all. One says, I think this challenge is for clergy and missionaries and those involved in special service. Well, think again. This letter is addressed generally to all Christians. Paul writes to all the saints in Rome, Romans 1, 7. We all ought to be able to say with Paul, whose desire was that Christ would be magnified in his body, whether by life or by death. I don't know about you, but that's a, a frequent prayer of mine in the morning. Lord, may, my, may you be magnified in my life today, whether by life or by death, come, come what may. A footnote here, uh, the word present in the phrase, present your bodies, a living sacrifice, is in the aorist tense. I think this is significant. Uh, now, we don't have aorist in English, but in Greek we do. And uh, some scholars want to say this indicates a once-for-all action, a, a once-for-all decisive offering. But technically, technically, the aorist tense only states fact of action. It doesn't really necessarily tell you anything else about it. So Paul is simply saying, do this, do this. In truth, believers often get off track and need to come back to the commitment of Romans 12.1. This may often need to be revisited. In this, it is parallel to walking in the Spirit. We're told to walk in the Spirit. But what if we find ourselves getting off track with the lust of the flesh? What should we do? Well, we should get back to walking in the Spirit. The same is true in regard to presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. If we have crawled off the altar, so to speak, we need to again present ourselves and get back to where we should be. The fact of action of presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice should be applied as needed. It ever remains our reasonable service. Someone has described this presenting or offering as comparable to the analogy of marriage. You see, in the act of marriage, each partner commits themselves unreservedly to the other person. But then as they go along, adjustments are often needed to be made in keeping with the original pledge. And so it is with God's people. In salvation, we recognize Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. But then in the process of the relationship, we often need to make adjustments to where we are properly aligned with our initial faith commitment. A living sacrifice is holy to God. Holy means set apart. This is biblical separation, living a set-apart life for God. This is the blessed man of Psalm 1 who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. A living sacrifice, this is acceptable to God. This is what God is looking for. Uh, acceptable to God means it's pleasing to Him. It's a life that in the end God will say, well done, living sacrifice. 
And this is always the goal. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, therefore we also have this as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Whether at home in the body or, or absent, God finds us well-pleasing. Well, what does a, a living sacrifice look like? Well, it's total. It's holy. It's acceptable to God. And it's reasonable. You say, Pastor, I think you've drifted into unreasonable territory. No, no, I haven't. The Bible's very clear. This is reasonable. You see, that phrase, your spiritual service of worship, is actually the translation of two Greek words, meaning rational service. Here's our Greek words. Spiritual. Logikos. Logical or rational. Service of worship is actually the Greek word latria, meaning spiritual service. So rational is the idea of intelligent and deliberate. It's thoughtful. Service is uh, spiritual service. It's a word used for the, the service of a priest. And we are a holy priesthood as believers. We should therefore serve sensibly or accordingly. We should intelligently live consistent with our holy calling, with who we now are in Christ. Now, offering ourselves to God is not only logical, rational, sensible, it is the spiritual thing to do. A halfway commitment really is spiritually irrational. I mean, when you consider all that God has done for you and for me, it makes total sense for us to sell out to Him and live for Him. Consider just a sampling, just a sampling of the mercies of God as seen in Romans 8, which is my favorite chapter. But notice, notice these things. No condemnation in Christ. Empowered to live righteous by the Spirit. Spirit of God dwells in you. The promise of physical resurrection. Led by the Spirit, sons of God. Receive the Spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Children, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, will be glorified with Him. Glory to be revealed in us. And awaiting the redemption of the body. Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, makes intercession. All things work together for good for those who love Him. For new, predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Predestined, called, justified, glorified. God is for us. Who can be against us? Delivered up His Son for us. Freely gives us all things. No charge against us. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. More than conquerors through Him who loved us. Right large over the mountain peak of Romans 8. The mercies of God. If that doesn't move you, you really need to check yourself. It is totally logical in the light of the extravagant mercies of God to commit ourselves fully to the Lord. Nothing else makes spiritual sense. Now when in eternity you stand before God, what will matter then? I submit to you that so many things that right now seem important won't matter at all. Then all that will matter is how we lived for Christ. That will be the issue. For, for all eternity, what did we do on earth for Christ's sake? C.T. Studd again said, only one life to live. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last I was thinking about this. You know, recently we had a, a major leader in our circles fall. And uh, <clears throat> as I was thinking about him, a tragic thing, really sorrow, uh, my heart filled with sorrow over the whole thing. But, but I went to a place where, you know, I read lots of commentaries, uh, about 25 commentaries for a message on Sunday morning, like I'm preaching you, to you this morning. And uh, I went to, he had a commentary on, on most of the books of the New Testament, and I went to and the, the site, and it had all his messages, and, and then it said, all of his stuff has been removed. And I thought about, you know, that's kind of how it is when you lose your reward. It's all gone! What did you do with your life? Threw it away. My goodness, tragic. Only what's done for Christ will last Isaac Watts said, love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. 
Verse 2. Romans 12, 2. We get out at noon, right? Oh, no, I know when we get out. <laughs> Just thought maybe I'd aw awake you. Anyway. <laughs> Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind. That you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Paul here continues to build on what a sold-out commitment to God looks like. Here he gives two commands. One negative, one positive. They're two sides of the same commitment. First, he says, do not be conformed to this world. Now, again, we have to be very intentional about this. You might drift into carnality, but you won't drift into holiness. You have to be intentional. You have to present yourself to God. And that involves commitment to not be conformed to the world. You see, the world is the system of rebellion headed up by Satan, which is comprised of all unbelievers, the pull of the world, the influence of the world, the pressure of the world is ever-present, and we feel it. William R. Newell writes, Satan has developed this fatal world order with its philosophy, man's account of all things, but changing it from time to time, its science ever seeking to eliminate the supernatural, its government with man exalting himself, its amusements adapted to blot out realities from the mind, its religion to soothe man's conscience and allay fears of judgment. Yeah, the world ha has its own system. It's all a system of rebellion. The word conformed means to be shaped by a, the pattern of a mold. J.B. Phillips translates this as, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. You see, the world wants to influence us in terms of its values, its attitudes, its moral atmosphere. You see, the world demands tolerance. And once they get tolerance, they demand acceptance. And once they get acceptance, they demand normalcy. And once they have normalcy, they demand celebration. Make no mistake, the world is pushing its rebel agenda as hard as it can. There's nothing neutral about it. And we feel the pressure to go along to get along. And unless you're willing to take a non-conformist stand, you will be compromised by it. You have to intentionally determine not to skate along, not to be shaped, not to be conformed to the spirit of the age. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul writes, But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You see, the cross is the great divider. Paul said, The world is dead to me and I to the world. The world wanted nothing to do with Paul's Christ perspective, and Paul wanted nothing to do with their anti-God perspective. Our calling is to not be conformed to the world. We are not to compromise with the world's value system, with its worldview. Actually, the word world here in Romans 12, 2 is more accurately translated as age, referring to this temporary age in which Satan is allowed to be the God of this age. Of course, God is always sovereign. But in 1 John 5, 19, it says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Just think of it. This whole world system. Satan is, is running this world system that's in rebellion against God. In John 12, 31, Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. The lost belong to Satan. He's their father. Galatians 1, 4. Again, Paul says... Of Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father. Now the Jewish rabbis contrasted this present age with the messianic age which is to come. One day the Messiah will come and he will reign in righteousness. In contrast to being conformed to the world of rebellion, the believer is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
To be conformed to the world is to have your thinking shaped by the world. And that's contrary to what the Christian is all about. To be transformed in your mind is to have your thinking shaped by God. Shaped by God's word, which results in spiritual growth and becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ. Now, if you're going to go the way of the world, you're not going God's way. If you're going God's way, you're not going the world's way. And you can't have it both ways at the same time. Either you're going to go the way of the world, or you're going to go God's way. And at any given time, you're going one way or the other. And going God's way involves two sides of the same coin of holiness. On the one side, we refuse to be conformed to the world. On the other side, we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds. They go together. And it is this renewing of our mind that causes us to think biblically and to refuse the world's way. Both conformed and transformed are in the passive voice, meaning an outside agency is actually influencing the person. Either we are allowing the world to influence us or God. The word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, from which we get the English word metamorphos. Transformed, see the Greek word metamorpho, English metamorphosis. The word metamorpho means to change from one form to another. We speak of it in terms of English, uh, uh, in terms of a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly. This word is used in reference to Christ's transformation on, on the Mount of Transformation, uh, where the disciples really had a pre-kingdom glimpse of the kingdom glory as he was transformed before them. The only other place this exact word is used in the New Testament is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we read there, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. As we gaze at Christ, we are being transformed. Now the idea of transformed is that of being changed from the inside out. Inside out. And there are two realities to this idea of transformation. There is what the Bible calls being born again, regeneration. At the moment of saving faith, it says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. We're a whole new creation. And that's a positional reality that never changes. We have a new nature that is now wed with the Holy Spirit, who has come to live inside us. That's a spiritual reality all believers share in. And that reality will never change. However, as new creations in Christ, we are not a finished product. In practice, God is at work in us to more and more transform us, present tense, into the character of Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And this is a lifelong process that will be only completed in glory. What Paul has in view here in Romans 12.2 is the transformation of our character through the renewing of our mind. As noted in Romans 8.29, we see that God has determined to conform us into the image of His Son. But this involves a process. In conversion, we come to repentance. What is repentance? Literally, the word repentance means to have a change of mind. In repentance, we come to have a change of mind about sin, about self, about the Savior. It's a life-changing change of mind. I mean, if you really come to repentance, you'll never be the same again. I mean, there's, all the relationships of life change. Your relationship with God, your relationship with the world, your relationship with Satan. You're in, all things have become new. The spiritual battle is for the mind. In repentance, we come to see the truth of Christ as Lord and Savior. But then in the details, we need to grow in relationship to this truth. We need constant nurturing to that end. We need consistency. Again, the spiritual battle is for the mind. We are to present our bodies, but you know what? That involves thinking activity. 
which activates the body. The mind controls the body. Transformation takes place as the mind is consistently being renewed. Thus, the renewed mind drives spiritual growth and maturity. Expositors uh, says this, uh, has this thought. Uh, the renewing of the mind seems to mean that the believer is to keep going back in his thought to the original commitment, reaffirming its necessity and legitimacy in the light of God's grace extended to him. Well, I think that's true. Again, note the central place of the mind. I often say Christianity is the thinking person's faith. The mind is central. What goes on in the mind governs everything. Our convictions, our decisions, our commitments, our growth, our consistency. However, instead of the mind, so many today want to make Christianity all about feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. You didn't know you were going to get special music, did you? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's just a feeling that will go away. <laughs> In terms of spirituality, many today ask, how are you feeling? And that's legit. I mean, I get it. But rarely do people say, what are you thinking? The battleground between being conformed to the world and being transformed is found in the mind. You know what? Christians must think differently. One commentator says, the problem with many Christians is that they live a life based on feelings. Well, life based on feelings is, how do, you, how do I feel today? How do I feel about my job? How do I feel about my wife? How do I feel about worship? How do I feel about the preacher? Let's stop right there for a moment, shall we? <laughs> this life by feeling will never know the transforming power of God because it ignores the renewing of the mind. It's the mind we're concerned about. Now, feelings have their place, but they're the caboose, not the engine. The engine that drives everything is the mind. The mind controls the body. The mind is the control center of the life involving our attitudes and our actions. Get your mind straight and your life will be straight. Paul doesn't elaborate here on how the mind is renewed, resulting in spiritual transformation. But from other scriptures, we know this happens as the Spirit works in us through the Word. God's truth shapes our thinking. And that, in turn, changes us little by little. Little by little we are being transformed into the image of Christ by the way of the Spirit working through the Word. Now as a young Christian, I was taught this. We master the Word through memorization and the Word masters us through meditation. You know, I think there's truth in that, a lot of truth in that. Here in Psalm 119, Thy word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against thee. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. I've been teaching through Psalms on Sunday night for about the last year and a half or so. Uh, I taught through the Messianic Psalms and somebody said, hey, that was really good. Maybe you could do the rest of the Psalms. And I thought, wow, that's a big assignment. But here we are. But I've been teaching through Psalms on Sunday night, and uh, one lady, dear godly lady in our church, approached me one day, and she said, I think we see in the Psalms so often the process of renewing your mind. You see in the Psalms, often, uh, the writer starts out with being distraught, spiritually out of joint. But then by the time we get to the end of the Psalm, the writer has refocused, ends with a completely different frame of mind represented. I thought, that's pretty good. That's true. This is your mind is being transformed as you focus on God. A good number of years ago, I had a young man come to me. He was broken over his immorality. I challenged him to do scripture memory with me. And so we started getting together weekly, and, and we memorized about 100 verses together. And it totally transformed his life. That's God doing it, but he does it through his word. Today, he's a leader in our church. And to this day, as I deal with men who struggle with porn, which is so common everywhere, it seems, it's, and it's so accessible everywhere, it's hard to even escape it. But uh, 
what I do with them, uh, even to this very day, we memorize Scripture. I want them to saturate their minds with the Word of God. Renewing your mind by filling your mind with the Word of God is life-transforming. There's nothing more powerful than the Bible. It's the very living Word of God. It's living and powerful. It's able to change you. The world is a place of distraction. Where is your mind? Where is your mind at? I mean, all this stuff, just the buzz of the world constantly. It's so, it's so easy to take our focus off of the Lord and get our mind on the things of the world. It's the great struggle we have. It's about the mind. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. You, know, you are responsible to set your mind. Ella Wheeler Wilcox wrote many years ago, One ship sails east and another west. By the selfsame winds that blow, tis the set of the sails and not the gales that tells the way we go. Set your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Well, how can that be achieved? Well, by being transformed by the renewing of your mind, staying in the Word, staying focused on God and the things of God. And as you do this, you will prove something, namely the will of God as it is worked out in your life. Want to live out God's will? Live a Word-filled life. Now, sometimes the challenge comes from someone who says, prove it! You ever heard that? Prove it! Well, to prove something means to demonstrate the truth of it by having it tested. Tested and proven. To prove the will of God is to demonstrate it in your life. And thus to prove it is good, acceptable, and perfect in your experience. The word prove corresponds to the word present in verse 1. To present yourself a living sacrifice results in proving the will of God in your life. The Greek word good means that which is intrinsically good with the idea of being profitable or beneficial. The will of God is wholesomely good, bringing about blessing. It's acceptable, meaning it's pleasing, first of all, to God, but I think then also to us as we live it out, we find it to be satisfying and pleasing. And it's perfect, which means complete, that which accomplishes the desired end. It is the will of God lived out that completes a person. This is what we were created for. Now, Paul's not talking about the will of God in terms of vocation or other specifics regarding the non-moral decisions of life. Rather, what Paul is talking about in context is the moral will of God related to living for God, related to an all-out commitment to God. The will of God, above all, is that we live for Him. No matter what we're doing, you can live for God. No matter what we're doing, we should present our bodies to be a living sacrifice. No matter what we're doing, we should ever be doing it through the lens of transformation that seeks to live out the will of God. Someone has said this very simply, God's will for your life is to do the will of God. Isn't that simple? Profound, isn't it? Now, in doing the will of God, you prove it to be good, acceptable, and perfect. This is our calling. We are not to live for self but to live all out for God. We're to be radicals for God. Radicals, you know, Bible thumpers, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we are to be holy living sacrifices. This is our reasonable service. So to summarize what we have seen this morning, uh, we are called to be a living sacrifice, which is wholly acceptable, not conformed to the world, transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is the will of God. This is what God wants you to do. And that's good, acceptable, and perfect. In short, what Paul in essence is saying here in Romans 12, 1 and 2, is that in light of all that God has done for us, we in turn should give our all for Him. We don't do this to be saved, but because we are saved, because we have received of the mercies of God. Realize that the therefore of Romans 12, 1 comes after the great prolonged discussion of justification by faith and builds on it. We don't serve God to get saved. We serve with our all because we have been saved. Our service is the fruit of our faith. 
Now, when a professing Christian dies, it's often the tendency of somebody to say, well, they've entered into their, their well done. Well, maybe not so fast. Number one, I think it's God's place to say well done, not ours. Uh, but I would remind us that whenever well done is pronounced in the Bible, it's always in reference to the faithful, as in well done, good and faithful servant. And here's my conviction that I want to share with you this morning. It's my conviction that only those believers who consistently live out the life of being a living sacrifice, it's only those who in the end will hear God's well done. Only a life sold out for Jesus is worthy of well done. Unknown author wrote this. So he died for his faith. That's fine. More than most of us do. But say, can you add to that line that he lived for it too? In his death, he bore witness at last as a martyr to truth. Did his life do the same in the past from the days of his youth? It's easy to die. Men have died for a whim, a wish, from bravado, passion, or pride. Was it harder for him? But to live every day, to live out all the truth that he dreamt while his friends met his conduct with doubt and the world with contempt, was it thus that he plotted ahead, never turning aside? Then we'll talk of the life that he lived. Never mind how he died. Brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable spiritual service, and thus prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you have done for us, categorized by Paul as the mercies of God. It's all a mercy. Every kindness you have shown to us, it's not deserved. It's a mercy. And so we thank you for that. And Lord, what is to be our response? What is acceptable? Well, it's that we commit ourselves. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Lord, may we do so this morning. May you have your way in our hearts as we contemplate these things from the word of God this morning. Again, we thank you for your word. May it bear much fruit in our lives for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.